Are there unicorns in the Bible? Yes. Are there unicorns in the world? Yes. And if you just laughed at me, you're going to need to repent in 20 seconds. It's time for Wretched. Yeah. Are you actually a superhero? I actually am a superhero, yeah. Don't turn that channel. Am I wrong? No. Do you think I'm right? No. Being ridiculous is easy. Talk about change. I'm Anderson Cooper. Ah, that's a lie. I'd be wearing a small t-shirt and pushing my biceps out. Why are you doing this? To hassle people. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Peter Brady here. <laughs> Welcome to Wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host. The Wretch, the song refers to here, dear Christian, is a question you can ask your Bible. Why exactly do you, a dear Bible, talk about unicorns? Why does the Bible mention unicorns? If you look up the word unicorn in the Webster's New World Dictionary, it says that unicorn is a mythical horse-like animal with a single horn growing from its forehead. This is a depiction of a unicorn. This animal is mythical. It's fictional. It's make-believe. It's not real. There's none of these alive today, and no scientist has ever found a fossil of one, and yet unicorns are mentioned in the Bible nine times in the books of Numbers, Deuteronomy, Job, Psalms, and Isaiah. And so because of this, people like to scoff at the Bible and say things like this. So, now if you believe in God, you believe in unicorns. Which is fantastic. If we're going to use the Bible for science, we've got some tough things to explain. What are you going, what are you going to do about uh, unicorns? Or mentioned eight times in the Bible. I want to tell you what, we have never found a fossil of a unicorn. By the way, where are the unicorns that are referred to in the Bible? Where, where are those, either in the fossil record or today? I'd like to see one of those. Another one of those interesting tests that continues to get failed. Well, if you get an old 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary, which is the very first edition dictionary that Webster came out with about 200 years ago, and if you look up the word unicorn, it says that unicorn is an animal with one horn, the monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. Notice how this definition says absolutely nothing about a horse. It says nothing about a horse-like animal or a mythical animal or a fictitious creature. It says absolutely nothing about Greek mythology whatsoever, but rather it says that this is a name that is often applied to the rhinoceros. Wait a minute. What? The rhinoceros? You mean this is a unicorn? But the rhinoceros has two horns. How could this be a unicorn? Well, if you look up the word rhinoceros in the same dictionary, it says that rhinoceros is a genus of quadrupeds of two species, one of which, the unicorn, has a single horn growing almost erect from the nose. This animal, when full grown, is said to be 12 feet in length. There's another species with two horns, the bicornis. They are natives of Asia and of Africa. According to Noah Webster, back in the early 1800s, it was understood that there were two species of the rhinoceros. The one-horned species was called unicorn, and then the two-horned species was called bicornis. So basically, you get a 200-year-old Noah Webster's Dictionary, and look up the word unicorn, it says rhinoceros, then look up the word rhinoceros, and it says unicorn. That was just 200 years ago. The old King James was translated 400 years ago, in 1611. So if the definition of the word unicorn has changed in just the past 200 years from rhinoceros to horse, then it doesn't make much sense to take a modern definition of the word unicorn and apply it to a 400-year-old translation of the Bible. That's illogical. As a matter of fact, even today, the scientific name of the Asian one-horned rhinoceros is Rhinoceros unicornis, and Deuceros bicornis is the scientific name of a two-horned rhinoceros. Well, where do you think those scientific names came from? Hmm, I wonder... Well, they came from the Latin. Unicornis and bicornis are Latin words. Well, that's interesting, because in Psalm 92, verse 10, the psalmist is praying and says, But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. If you look up this verse in the Latin Bible, the word that's being used here is the word unicornis. Unicornis is the same Latin word that's being used in the scientific name of the Asian one-horned rhinoceros. In Job 39, verse 9, God is speaking to Job and says, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? If you look up this verse in the Latin Bible, the word that's being used here is the word rhinoceros. Rhinoceros is the Latin word that's being used in this scripture verse. Interesting. Rhinoceros, unicornis. Rhinoceros, unicornis. 
As a matter of fact, in these nine scripture verses, there's actually five different Latin words that are being used. Rhinoceros, rhinoceratis, rhinocerata, unicornium, and unicornis. These five Latin words are what's being used when the Old King James Version of the Bible says unicorn. Take all the time you need to repent if you were snickering at the idea of unicorns being in the Bible. Okay, I can't help myself. Do you remember the fellows who were sitting in their university setting pontificating? Unicorns in the Bible, how ridiculous. And clearly, they don't have a clue what they were talking about. A dude on YouTube put that together and basically revealed they simply don't have a clue. Now that we've resolved that issue, by the way, there's more to that video coming up. Now that we've resolved the answer to the question, are there unicorns in the Bible and unicorns in the world? Yes. Now let us endeavor to ask our Bible 14 more questions. Why would we do that? Well, we discussed that on Herman Who, available at Wretched.tv. If you ask these questions when you are reading your Bible, you're going to get more out of it. Diving in and trying to figure out exactly what's going on, who the author is, why were they writing it, to whom were they writing it, and what does it mean to me, will help you read the Bible with your brain engaged more, understanding how to take the Word of God that includes unicorns, and apply it to your life. Thank you to Stephen. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I think it's actually pronounced unicorn. He likes lists. I like lists. Here we go. 14 questions you can ask your Bible. Who is the author of the passage? Number two. Who were the recipients? These are just really foundational, but if you keep that in view, it will help you understand the point that he is trying to make to them. And then I can ask myself the question, is what he was writing to or about them somehow apply to me? Number three, you could ask your Bible, what's the historical background of the passage? Understanding the historical background of the Declaration of Independence helps you to get what it's all about. Same thing is true with the Bible. When we understand what was going on at that time, the history of the people to whom it was written, the history of the people of Israel, what is going on in the world with the Roman Empire or the Assyrians or the Babylonians, helps you get what's going on. You could also ask your Bible, what is the outline structure of the passage? Why would you want to do something like this? Didn't you do that in grade school and hated it back then? Well, when we understand exactly, exactly what the author intended by looking at the structure of the sentence, we will then not misinterpret it. You could also ask your Bible, number five, are any words repeated? And is there any significance to that repetition? You read the book of Daniel, for instance. I think the word king is used dozens of times. Why? There's a point to it. I'll tell you what, here's homework for you. Go read the book of Daniel, not that long, and figure out why is the word king, 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 king used over and over again. There is significance to repetition. Number six, Ask your Bible, are there any unusual words in the passage that call for more exploration? Like, uh, unicorn. <laughs> I'm coming really close to being smug about this whole unicorn thing, aren't I? <laughs> and number seven, ask your Bible, how does the passage fit into the surrounding paragraph, the chapter, the book? And that way, you make sure that you don't take something out of the verse that the chapter or the book or other books that the author wrote or all of Scripture, hence the analogy of Scripture, would not allow for. There you have seven of the 14 questions you can ask your Bible when we come back on Wretched. The other seven, got that right, the other seven questions. And just because, <laughs> more on the unicorn business next on Wretched. <laughs> Welcome back to The Godfather. I busted it. I just plain broke it. This is not a unicorn. This is a horse. A unicorn is not a horse with a horn. A unicorn is actually a rhinoceros, my dear atheist friend. Here's a book that was published in 2003 called The Return of the Unicorns, The Natural History and Conservation of the Greater One-Horned Rhinoceros. On the front cover of this book, there's a picture of some rhinoceros. And this book is called 
The Return of the Unicorns. This book was published in 2003. You can buy it on Amazon.com for ten bucks. Here's a creature which scientists today refer to as the giant unicorn. It's an extinct species of a giant one-horned rhinoceros called Elasmotherium sibiricum, and scientists today call it the giant unicorn. As a matter of fact, this is the creature which creation scientists like Ken Ham believe to be the unicorn that's being mentioned in the Bible. Ken Ham is the president of Answers in Genesis and the founder of the Creation Museum. And this is the creature which he believes to be the unicorn that's being mentioned in the Bible when God is questioning Job and says, Will the unicorn be willing to serve you? Will he stay in your stall? Can you hitch a unicorn to a plow? Or will he plow the valleys behind you? Since he's so strong, can you trust him? Or will you leave your labor to him? Can you trust him to bring home your grain and gather at your threshing floor? The question is, though, why is it that some of the Latin verses say rhinoceros, but then others say unicornus? Well, in Psalm 92, verse 10, according to the context of the scripture, it's talking about a one-horned animal. It says phrases like, my horn, and the horn. That's why it uses the word unicornus, because it's talking about a one-horned animal. However, in Deuteronomy 33, according to the context of the scripture, it's talking about a two-horned animal. Moses is speaking here about Joseph, and he says that Joseph's horns are like the horns of unicorns. And then he goes on to say, they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Basically, Moses is saying here that Joseph's two horns are Joseph's two sons. Ephraim and Manasseh are Joseph's two sons. You see, in the King James Bible, when it says unicorns plural with an S, there's actually a marginal note. And if you look up that marginal note, it says that in the Hebrew, it's actually a unicorn singular. In the Hebrew text, the word being translated unicorn is singular, but the word being translated horns is actually plural possessive. So it's basically saying that these plural horns are being possessed by this singular unicorn, which would mean that it's not actually a unicorn. That's why the verse in Latin doesn't say unicornus, but rather it says rhinoceros, talking about the two-horned rhinoceros, which actually makes perfect sense because the two-horned rhinoceros has a larger horn and then it has a smaller horn. You see, back in Genesis 48, Jacob prophesied that Ephraim would be greater than Manasseh. He said that Manasseh shall be great, but that Ephraim shall be greater. He said that Manasseh shall become a people, but that Ephraim shall become a multitude of nations. And then later on in Deuteronomy 33, Moses is confirming that Ephraim really is greater than Manasseh, because he says, the ten thousands of Ephraim, but the thousands of Manasseh. He's saying that Ephraim consists of tens of thousands of people, but Manasseh only has thousands of people, thus confirming that Jacob's prophecy really did come true. Ephraim really is greater than Manasseh, just like Jacob prophesied. And in order to paint a picture of who Joseph is, he says that Joseph's horns are like the horns of the rhinoceros, the two-horned rhinoceros, which has a larger horn and a smaller horn, the larger horn being Ephraim and the smaller horn being Manasseh. So it is true that the old King James version of the Bible has a mistake in it, but the mistake is not that it mentions a mythical horse-like animal with a single horn on its head. The mistake is that it mentions a one-horned rhinoceros when some scripture verses, according to the context, are actually talking about a two-horned rhinoceros. You gotta love the Bible, which never, ever, ever is wrong, ever. Even when it talks about unicorns, and <laughs> I broke, I hit it with my knee, and I just made it go flying off. And even when they're talking about rhinoceroses, for your consideration, seven more questions you can ask your Bible, now that we've resolved the little unicorn issue, so that you can get the most out of it. Courtesy of Stephen, I think you pronounced that rhinoceros, if I'm not mistaken, gives us 14 questions. We already took care of seven, hence seven more questions. Here we go. Ask your Bible when you're reading it. Why did the author place the passage here and not somewhere else? In other words, what is the context perhaps telling me about this particular verse? Are you starting to get the feeling that maybe, just maybe, you shouldn't burn through the reading of your Bible? Do you need to ask all 14 of this que these questions every single time you open up the book? No. But the more you do this, the more you will be mindful of these things. The more it'll simply just 
happen. And when you're reading the verse, you're going to be thinking, hey, wait a second, I've got to think about context and position and the word order and repetition and what the author said on the subject in other places. And you're going to get more out of the book. Number nine, ask your Bible in one sentence, what's the main point of the passage? Can you rephrase the verse? In other words, you're basically going to be translating and interpreting it all together. What's the point of the verse? Can you say it in your own words? Number 10, ask your Bible, how would the original audience have been affected by the passage? Here's a good rule. If the original audience would not have understood it the way the preacher is saying it, then the preacher has it wrong, and so do you. If the original audience wouldn't have said, this verse is not about how to start up a business and be successful at it, then you shouldn't understand it that way either. Number 11, ask your Bible, how does this passage connect to the overall storyline of the Bible? Number 12, ask your Bible, how does this passage, ooh, this is good, reveal Jesus as Savior? I don't think every verse does specifically, but always be looking for Jesus in everything. Number 13, ask your Bible, how does God want this passage to function in my life? Is this a verse I need to apply to me? And finally, number 14, ask your Bible, what kind of response does this passage call for? In other words, when you read something that does apply to you, are you going to do anything about it? So there you have it, if you will. 15 questions you can ask your Bible. You only need to worry about 14 now. This is Wretched. Assuming, of course, you can afford it, there's no excuse for missing a Psalm 119 conference this year. Six locations, the theme, discernment, you'll be able to defend the truth better, and best of all, you'll love the Savior more. Sign up at Wretched.tv. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool God none of the time. Did I just double negative that? <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you can't trick God is what I'm trying to say. Welcome back to our wretched. I don't know if you have ever been in an accountability group. Maybe you and a pal, you get together to ask, hey, how are things going? We need to remember two things if we get together for accountability's sake. Number one, do you remember that little presentation by Tullian Chavijan, Rhymes with Religion, the pastor of Coral Ridge Church, which used to be D. James Kennedy's church? He said, make sure that you aren't just talking about sin. And sin. What sins have you committed? Did you commit this sin? Did you commit that sin? What about that sin? And you never talk about the gospel that Jesus died even for those sins. Don't forget the gospel in your accountability group. But the second little challenge, if you will, to the accountability group is we have to remember we can lie. We, we can kind of shield it. We can pretend or we can maneuver the conversation so that we don't have to be truly transparent. The only one who doesn't allow us to get away with it or to shade the truth or not to reveal what's really going on is God himself. So accountability groups can be helpful and even wise. But know this. The best accountability group for you, for your children, is God himself. Having said that, Stephen Altruck, who is this guy with his list, comes up with seven questions that you uh, can ask a friend or maybe even ask yourself to be accountable. Uh, here we go. Uh, number one, have you uh, been consistently pursuing the Lord through scripture reading and prayer? Ask your friend, ask yourself that. Because if, if, if we're not practicing some of these basic things, uh-oh, you're going to be in trouble real fast. Number two, ask your pal or yourself, have you diligently pursued your wife or husband this week? In other words, are you taking care of the most important ministry in your life? And that is your family. First of all, not your kids. Kids second. Spouse first. Are you pursuing and loving and, sir, if it's you, protecting, living with your spouse? Madam, are you showing respect to, you, to your husband? We kind of dig that a lot. And number three, ask your accountability partner, person, friend, or yourself, have you seen any persistent patterns of sin in your life recently? Why? Because if you see anything that's kind of consistent here. You know, on Tuesday night, I was watching that show, and I should have turned the channel. 
And I did it on Wednesday night, too, and Thursday, come to think of it, and Friday and Saturday. Oh, where'd you go? Oh, then you got yourself some problems here. You've got something persistent, and you got to take the X to the root. Because remember, if you're not busy killing sin, sin will kill you. No, I didn't write that. Here's the next question you can ask your friend, accountability partner, or yourself. Last week, you confessed struggling with whatever that sin was. Have you taken steps to fight it this week? Remember, the Christian walk is not perfection, but it is about direction, and it's about affection. I, I did write that. And remember this, it is about being in the war. Are you winning every battle all the time, every day? No, we still lose, but we're in the fight. That, by the way, is one of the best signs that you can know that you're actually saved. It's not that you never sin, but it's that you're hating that bad boy and you see it as the monster that it is and you're trying to slay it. The next question you can ask your friend, yourself, your accountability partner, or anybody else you see at the shopping mall, when you gave in to that particular sin, what were you believing about God in that moment? What were you believing about yourself? Ooh, that's kind of provocative, isn't it? Your action where you committed the sin. What theology did you have at that moment about God? Was it perhaps low? Ah, he doesn't care so much. God doesn't really look inside of the heart. Or maybe you thought you, you didn't run to him because you thought, well, he's kind of that ogre father who would just mm, like that. What's your theology about God? And what's your theology about yourself? This is, this is important. Yeah, it's, it, it's the understanding that you're a wretched, vile sinner. But remember, one of the most helpful things to help you in your war against sin is remembering who you are. Who are you? You are a saint. That's what you need to remember. You are actually positionally a saint. Not because you are so perfect, but because Jesus was perfect. And now God positionally, because of Jesus, sees you as a saint. And yes, we mortify sin. Yes, we try to kill it. But how do we do it? It's by recognizing who I am positionally and behaving the way that I actually have been made. That way, your motive is gospel fuel and not law fuel. Ask yourself, your friend or whomever, what is the truth that you need to believe in this situation? How do you need to change your thinking so you don't do that again in that situation? And finally, number seven, when you had the conflict with whomever that you had that fight with, what were you craving at that moment? Why? Because inevitably, underneath the sin is always, always, always an idol. Figure out who the idol is besides Jesus so you can recognize it and then kill it so that you can love him so that he can be all in all. And until tomorrow, go serve your king.